Hi, the Pragmatic Luther again. Today I'm here with some beginner or intermediate tips for uh, woodworkers or guitar makers for that matter who own a table saw. I want to do a demonstration on proper ripping on a table saw. I'm not going to deal with cross cutting today because ripping is the more dangerous uh, operation on a table saw and it's very important that you understand completely how to do this properly. And I'm going to spend some time talking about the theory of the table saw because that is key in understanding why you can and can't do certain things with ripping operations. And it also helps in understanding exactly what a ripping operation is. So for the rest of the video, I'll be off camera, but we'll get started. I have the camera on the table saw runway close so that you can see exactly what's going on. And you can see that there are no guards and there are no splitters. That's so that you can see precisely what's happening. What you see here is in no way um, an advocation of how you should have your table saw set up. Uh, but it's, it's for visibility and visibility only. The first thing that I want to establish before we talk about actually ripping something on a saw is that the blade itself is what dictates what we're going to do. The blade spins in one plane and it does not compromise because it's anywhere from six to ten inches uh, wide. So it can't cut curves and it cannot tolerate material moving in a curve through it or around it. That's inarguable. So that means that we have requirements in order to rip anything or to cut anything on a table saw. And that requirement is that the material that we're cutting must pass in a path that is parallel to the plane of rotation of the blade. It must be parallel to the plane of rotation of the blade. It is inarguable. There is no exception. You see, it really doesn't matter if you orient the piece this way to that blade. If you can hold it perfectly rigid and guide it in a path parallel to the plane of rotation, you could make that cut. The trick is it has to remain traveling in that direction, parallel to the plane of rotation. The next thing is, what is ripping? Well, ripping is cutting with the grain of the wood, and cross-cutting is cutting across the grain of the wood. And I'm going to bend down here. Horse hockey. That's horse hockey. And that's easy to prove. Here's a piece of MDF. Where's the grain? There isn't any. Here's a piece of thin plywood. Well, if I wanted to rip this, I'm going to put this edge against the fence, but the grain is going this way. So let's stop talking about grain direction, okay? Don't, don't talk about that. So a ripping operation, by definition, and by those rules established by that saw blade and the way it spins, is defined as cutting parallel to the longest edge of the workpiece. Ripping is cutting parallel to the longest edge of the workpiece. I'm going to bring that blade down. Okay? If we try any other technique, this by definition is not ripping because we are not cutting parallel to the longest edge of the workpiece. And of course, this would be a very dangerous thing. And we'll get to this in a couple of minutes. We have other requirements. A board, a board must lay perfectly flat on that saw table. If it's allowed to rock, then it's going to travel out of parallel with the plane of rotation and it's going to kick back. A board needs to have a straight edge. Here's a nice piece of cherry. It's got a good straight edge on it. Yes, I could rip that. And it is rocking just a little bit. So guess what? I'm not going to rip it because you see when I push down on that, 
When I push down as that goes through the saw and that comes up, that rocking could cause that to kick back. So what do I do? I take this to the jointer and I smooth that surface. And then I re-straighten that edge to make sure that it's nice and square with this surface. I did a jointer presentation a couple of videos back. You may want to check that out if you haven't seen it. Here's a worst case yet. Look at this. That rocks so badly that there's no way that's going to be safe. It's going to rotate. It's going to dig into that blade somewhere and kick back. Well, what if I put it on this side? Because, you know, this is the, con the convex side. Excuse me, the concave side is down. But look, the board is in wind. It's still extremely dangerous. So please don't do this. I don't care. I don't care what you're trying to do or how, how wide it is. You think you're going to get away with it. You're not. You won't get away with it. So don't do it. All right. I'm going to set up a quick ripping operation here. Uh, we're going to take a board that has a straight edge and a flat surface. And I'm just going to use this scrap of MDF because I don't like to indiscriminately cut up good lumber. So I'm going to adjust my fence to establish the width of cut that I want. I'm doing this at random. Obviously, in a real work situation, I would take a measurement there. Where do I put the blade? How high do I adjust it? For me, that's very simple. High enough to cut through the work, and that's all. Don't, don't bring the blade up. There's no need to. Notions about it cooling and clearing the gullets. No. There's, there's a whole bunch of that circle underneath where my finger's pointing. Those, guts, those gullets are going to clear, and there's going to be no heat build up unless you hold the wood still in there or you feed so slowly. So just above the surface of the work. And my theory is this. We want to cut through the material, but if for some awful reason my hand got into that, that blade's not sticking up so, so tall that it's going to cut me very, very deeply or even take an appendage off. I stand a little bit better chance with that blade down as far as I can keep it. Okay, I'm about ready to make a rip cut. Now, this piece that I'm going to cut happens to be, it's five and a quarter inches wide, and I'm barely going to touch it here because I just want to demonstrate the principle. Now, I'm not afraid to put my, my hand through there because I have more than five inches of space. You may want to use a push block instead, and that's perfectly all right. My recommendation is anything narrower than five inches, use a push block or some kind of pushing device. Narrower than five inches, too close. Um, wider than that, sometimes a push block actually becomes a problem, but you'll have to use your judgment as you go along on that. So now I'm ready to go. I have my fence in position. My blade is adjusted. I have my straight edge. I have my flat surface. By the way, the upper surface, that can be rough. It doesn't have to be planed or jointed or anything of the kind, as long as that surface on the table is flat. This edge, no, it's not going to be straight. Why are we cutting this? Well, we are making this cut to either straighten that edge to yield as much width as we can, or we're ripping pieces to a specified width. And it will, by nature, if the saw is properly adjusted and set up, it will be parallel edge. So I'm going to make a cut. I'm going to stand to the left of the blade because if a kickback occurs, it's likely to, to go past me. That's not a guarantee. And you may see me rotate into it a little bit. And I'm going to have to as I move the material through. But predominantly, I want to be just to the left of the blade. And I like to put my hip against the saw. It's just nice and stable. You're going to see my left hand is going to guide the material. I'm not going to guide it up here. I'm going to be back here. You're going to see my right hand underneath the material as I move in. And then at some point, I'm going to rotate my hand and hook my thumb behind the workpiece and close my fingers. Another technique 
is to hook your little finger up over that rip fence to keep your hands in there, kind of give yourself a leash. That's, that's a fair technique. So we're going to try this. Watch my hands. I'm going to move the material all the way past the blade, not just past it and figure that's good. I want to see it out here. Don't take any chances. This cannot hurt you. And this piece shouldn't be able to hurt you. Sorry for that bumping. This piece shouldn't be able to hurt you, but if it sets there, please don't touch it until the saw stops. Or if there's plenty of clearance, if you can kick that out of the way, but be very careful because if I kick this, now this end is into the blade. If I kick this, it could turn out that this end ends up in the blade. Neither one is a good situation. So best case scenario, if this piece lays there, shut the saw down or find it a safe way. You could reach back here all the way beyond the table and you could pull that off, but do be careful. Sorry, adjusting the camera a little bit here. Okay. Now, We've established that ripping is cutting parallel to the longest edge of the workpiece. But there's something else that I think is very important about the relationship between a blade and a rip fence. And that is the distance between the blade and the fence itself. Observe this. I wouldn't want to make this cut against the fence. I would not do this as a ripping operation because I'm not cutting parallel to the longest edge of the workpiece. And if I tried to do this, the saw would have so much leverage to pick that piece up and rotate it back at me. Kick back, same thing. So not safe. I've observed over the years that it seems key to keep in mind the distance between the blade and the fence and the length of the surface that bears against the fence. As soon as this distance between the fence and the blade becomes greater than the distance, excuse me, greater than the length of the piece that's against the fence, it becomes dangerous. Now the saw has more leverage than you want it to have, and you have less surface <clears throat> and therefore leverage to keep it against the fence. So what's the widest I could do? I guess a perfect square is about where it ends, okay? Now, another caution. This happens to be a piece of MDF. It's pretty slippery stuff. It glides along real nicely. I wouldn't want to try that with this piece of poplar. Look at this. It's too narrow. I'd have to be way down in here, something like this. You're not going to do it with your fingers. You're not going to do it with a push block because it can rock. This is just bad business all the way around. So when you're making shortcuts of any kind, better off if you don't have a good long rip surface against that fence, you're better off to do it with a crosscut guide of some kind, do it with a, a miter saw, or even cut them off on the bandsaw if you have to and hand plane them back to shape, whatever you got to do. So those are the important considerations. Uh, a last one, maybe. <clears throat> what about narrow material? I've got a piece of poplar here that's probably, well, happens to be three and a quarter, three and a half inches wide. Um, it's perfectly safe to rip this, certainly. This piece is, I'm judging, 11 and a half inches long. It's perfectly safe to rip it. But do keep in mind that the shorter a material gets, the more dangerous it can be. So take all the precautions you can. Uh, I have not discussed feather boards. That's a little bit different subject that's outside of my discussion today. I may come back to those at some point. So I believe you have it there. By the way, if you're going to rip narrow material, you do get a push block in there and, and you keep it handy so that it's right here near you. All right, let's just, let's try that one once.
Now you saw that when I put that through, I pushed this piece to one side. I, I swished it off to my left, thereby moving this piece of scrap, which works very well. You can do that. And you know, something in here close, you just don't want to get your hands back in here. That's the only trick. Okay, uh, I did not discuss ripping only part way through a piece of material. That is not ripping all the way through the thickness. Uh, that's something else that we might discuss later on in another place. Another couple of considerations that I thought it would be important to include are to warn you about ripping lumber uh, that you might buy from big box stores and lumber yards. There's nothing inherently wrong with that, but keep in mind that construction lumber in particular does not have to be dried to the same moisture content that lumber for interior use is. And it's frequently cut from trees that are quite young. And therefore it's susceptible to warping and twisting. And it can bind around your saw. You're not going to find a lot of it that's very straight. You're going to have to reshape it before you do anything with it anyway. And it still may not be trustworthy. It may split open as you rip it or it may bind around the saw. So just a warning with that sort of thing. And by the same token, uh, you get some wood somewhere, maybe you bought some from a yard sale or somebody had it in their barn and, and so on. And there's nothing wrong with that either. But do make sure your timber is dry before you start ripping into it. And anything that is full of cracks and knots and uh, is just clearly low grade lumber, you need to use a tremendous amount of caution because uh, knots can be shoved out of the work with a table saw and thrown at you. I've got a couple of them stuck in my ceiling. Um, they can be very dangerous and they're very tough on the machines anyway. So do be very careful about selecting timber before you rip into it. Uh, plywood is another concern. It's easily enough work, but as the pieces get larger, make sure you've got support on the in-feed and the out-feed side of your table saw and or help in handling it around the shop because it's it can get out of control in a hurry and you ruin expensive wood and again possibly get hurt so by all means work safely and choose your materials carefully make your materials work to your advantage so that your table saw can work to your advantage as well so there's ripping on a table saw Please keep in mind that I have covered only ripping on a table saw and review if you care to the key tenets that I shared with you. They're very, very important. Uh, also keep in mind that I am not monetized by any of these videos, nor am I subsidized in any way by anyone. I much prefer to be a very independent thinker. Um, if you like the video, I hope you'll put a like on it. And I hope that you might subscribe to my channel. And once again, uh, as an entry level woodworker or an intermediate woodworker, whatever, if you'd like to submit a suggestion for a topic that I might cover, I would certainly be uh, more than willing to address that and put that video out for you if it's something that I feel qualified to do. Uh, thanks again for watching. Hope you'll subscribe. This is Kevin Ledoux, the Pragmatic Luther at Ledoux Guitars.